right. So one of the things that drew me initially to programming was the process where you go from a creative idea in your head to a plan, a concrete idea of what you want to build and how, and finally you do it and you see it live and working. And that process, even though it sounds simple, was just amazing and it felt so good to go through and have it work just as I imagined in my head. And as I went through the first few years of my own career, I found honestly a whole industry that really supported that way of approaching problems. And engineers in general, I think, are often methodical, either inherently by their nature or by requirement of the role that they fill. After all, if I go out there and I try and build an API and I don't plan ahead, I don't think about how the pieces are all gonna fit together, it won't work at the end of the day. To some degree, I have to operate this way. And so you kind of get this whole repeated affirmation and uh, strengthening of this habit where you plan up front, you do it like you planned, and then it works at the end of the day. But something kind of started happening as I got more senior. And as my own career progressed, as I took on harder and harder challenges, uh, my game plan, this thing where I sort of looked at the problem, thought about the right way to tackle it, and then went for my plan, started to not always work the way that I intended. And so I was discovering more and more surprises lay uh, down the path of what I thought was a perfectly clear approach. And this wasn't working out kind of like I had uh, intended in my mind. And there were a couple aspects to this. The simplest one was all of my best laid plans, no matter how much time I was putting into them, uh, weren't going you know, exactly as I had imagined. And maybe that's okay. As projects get harder, inevitably surprises are gonna occur, and you deal with that as you go along. But it wasn't just that surprises were happening. The actual cost of being wrong was also alarmingly kind of getting worse, going up and to the right. And I was left in this spot where I wasn't sure how to keep progressing. The habits and the style that had worked so well for me and been reinforced over and over was exactly what was causing me problems now. And when I talk about making impossible decisions, it's this kind of scenario that I had in mind, where the upfront planning just wasn't cutting it anymore. And there's a couple reasons for this, a few distinct causes, I think. One was, there was a lot more ambiguity in the projects I was working on. I had kind of gotten comfortable with the idea of being, when I was very junior, handed a spec. Somebody says, go build this thing, and here's the details. And I can be pretty sure that nothing major is gonna change there. But more and more, as, as I got more senior, I was in scenarios where huge swaths of the project were just wildly not clear. Maybe the business goal was something that we felt a little fuzzy about. Or the business uh, uh, intent was clear, but the technical design was totally up in the air. Or maybe even like the technologies that I was working with or the organization I was working within were changing out from under me. And these kinds of ambiguities were just hard to deal with. I had no practice doing it. And I also started working on projects that just took up more time. There were longer time horizons at play. When you work on something for a couple weeks, probably nothing major is gonna shift out from under you. When you work on something that takes a year or two from when you first start thinking about it until final uh, realization, a whole lot of things can change. In fact, it's almost guaranteed to. And I started to realize that the decisions I was making were somehow getting stickier. They were harder to undo after I made them. And you can imagine a lot of examples of this, designing a, a public API, for instance, where once I design it, once I put it out there, I'm kind of a little bit stuck with it. And I can pull it back and I can change it after the fact, but it's gotten very expensive all of a sudden. And these were things I was just not engaging with and not planning ahead for. And I had kind of gotten in this mindset where my whole approach was just making sure that I was gonna design something so well up front that I was gonna be right for the life cycle of the project. And this was gonna work for me. And I kind of had gotten to the point where I realized this is just not gonna work anymore. Uh, I can't design something well enough up front to be right for the whole life cycle of the project. And so instead I needed to flip how I was looking at it and plan ahead for being wrong. This was gonna be an inevitability. And what I needed to be doing was engaging with how can I be ready for it, how can I adapt to it, rather than getting caught flat-footed. 
I work at Stripe, and one of the things that drew me to Stripe as a company was the kind of somewhat preposterously big ambition of what they want to do. And I think this is true of a lot of different tech companies out there. Many, many companies are doing things that have never been done before. That's kind of literally the whole point. But on the downside, if you're doing something that's never been done before, you're going to be running into a lot of unknowns. You're going to be seeing ambiguous problems. You're going to be working over maybe very, hopefully, very long time horizons. And you need some sort of plan to adapt to it. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Our goal here is to apply agile, lean approaches to these high uncertainty problem spaces. And we're going to just shamelessly borrow that idea from product development. When you're trying to find product market fit, you don't run in there with a crystal clear plan and then apply the plan heads down. You have to adapt to a shifting landscape. And we're going to use the same trick. And when I say lean, I'm thinking in particular of this book, uh, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And if you haven't seen it, that might be because it's kind of targeted at entrepreneurs. This is targeted at somebody trying to build something to find that product market fit. But I think there's tons of things we can transfer learn into making decisions, into being better uh, technical decision makers from this book. And we're going to, in particular, focus on this idea of building MVPs and not trusting our heads as much as we can to tell us what to expect, but actually getting things out there, working with our customers or with production, as the case may be for you, and using that to inform the rest of our decision making and navigate these really uncertain waters. And so that's sort of our plan for today. We're going to talk about three pieces. We're going to talk about forming an initial plan, not a final plan. We're going to talk about placing a series of small bets and essentially use that as our MVP process, where we want to go ahead and try some stuff out, see how it works in practice. And then most importantly, we're going to use the results of that first attempt to feed back into our overall plan. And we're going to approach this as much less of a one shot, plan things ahead of time, and then execute faithfully and much more of a regular iterative cycle that we're going to do going forward until the project's complete. So with that, let's talk about how we plan. Uh, there's a lot of material out there, written, online, videos, anything, about project management. Uh, I am not going to try and squeeze it all into one piece of this talk for you. But what I do want to do is highlight a couple of important deviations from what I was used to and what you might be used to. And we're going to assume two things that at least I never used to deeply assume about my project planning. We're going to assume that any plan we come up with right off the bat is going to be imperfect and it's going to be sort of uh, subject to change going forward. So as we kind of get our MVPs out there, we're going to learn something we didn't know before and that's going to need to affect our plan. So we're going to hold that plan lightly. And we're going to say, we know this isn't perfect. We know this is going to change later. We're going to build our process around that expectation. And then we also want to make sure that we're getting to market quickly. We can spend two weeks, two months, two years trying to build the perfect plan up front. But the reality is we're going to learn a lot just from getting out there and getting to production. So we're going to try and prioritize that and wisely trade off how much time we spend planning. And I'm going to start with some advice that might feel a little obvious. I'm going to say, please write things down. <laughs> we'll see some, a talk later uh, by Beth talking about the importance of documentation, how to be good at it. And I think this is something that honestly always gets short shrift and, and often gets dropped the first chance that people have. Um, I'm sure we all know it's good advice, but I know I've been a part of projects where people were confident enough in what they were building, why they were building it, how they were building it, that they just sort of went for it, right? You don't need to spend the time to write it down. But the reality is when you're working in these ambiguous problem spaces, when you're doing something that you've never done before, you want to be very, very cautious of everybody separately assuming they're talking about the same thing and quietly diverging in what they mean or why they mean it or their motivation behind the project. And one of the best ways you can do this is by writing it down. And we'll be able to look at this later and double check our work and see if we still agree with what our past selves said was a good idea. And then the other thing about this planning process that we really want to do is we want to prepare for hard choices. We think that we're working on a problem we're not familiar with, that we haven't done before. Maybe we don't know if anybody has done it before. And the reality is that that working group, that unit that's trying to move this project forward, is going to be in a spot where two informed, reasonable, excellent engineers or managers might not agree on the right path forward. 
and we need to be okay with that, and we also need to set ourselves up for success when that inevitably might happen. I don't know of a better way to do this than uh, what's called a DRI or a directly responsible individual, which is somebody who's tasked with the job of making sure that we make forward progress here, and they're accountable for it, but they're also kind of the voice for trying to converge on something rather than the entire working group splitting into little factions that just constantly argue with each other. And if you've ever been in the situation where you have a really contentious technical decision, it's alarmingly easy for these things to just stretch forever without actual forward progress or choices being made. And what we're worried about, the reason that we're focusing so much on this DRI, is we're worried about the entirely likely outcome that we essentially just get stuck in a decision process. If you've ever been in a meeting or four weeks of meetings where you're just hashing the same arguments over and over and you're not making progress, you're not deciding things, and somebody gets frustrated and they pipe up from the back, we could have just built this by now. We could already be done and know the answer, but we've been going over the same arguments over and over. That's analysis paralysis, and it, it hurts a lot. So we're gonna really put the DRI's job as getting past this stage. And we're gonna become comfortable with the idea here that maybe we're not gonna exit this planning process with 100% confidence in our solution. And that's not a bad thing. That might just reflect uh, the problem space that we're working in. Maybe it's not possible this early to have 100% confidence in anything. But we're gonna ask the group to come to a decision to recommend a way forward, or maybe a, a sort of space of ways forward, similar solutions, and start to try and actually use them. Now, I don't know your organization and what sort of cultural or communication norms are specific to you, but the idea behind disagreeing and committing is that you and, and your team need to find some healthy way to sort of not require 100% consensus to move forward, because that might take a really unacceptable amount of time. So our outcome, what do we want? We hopefully have documented our problem space and we've really written down in clear prose that we can all agree or disagree with what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, and any constraints of the problem space or our own technology that limit us. We want to do this so that later we can refer back to it and we want to do this just so we're all on the same page. We want to think in terms of this being maybe a difficult decision and make sure we're actively planning on how the group is going to successfully exit the planning process. We don't want to spend the first six weeks of our project just endlessly discussing and not making any valuable contributions, and some of that is something we can do in this process. And then lastly, we want to exit by having a directional approach. This doesn't have to have nailed down every single detail of the project yet, that's okay, but it wants to recommend somewhere that we should go, and it wants to imply the next step, which is making sure that we have a series of small bets of MVPs that we're going to try out and learn from in practice. Now, I really like the framing of this as a series of small bets because it sort of forces you right off the bat to admit this is a little risky. We don't totally know for sure this is going to work. Uh, there's a great book by Annie Duke, a professional poker player, and it really focuses around this idea of how do I factor in uncertainty and risk and things I'm not 100% certain of into decision making and how can I make my decisions even better as a result. And lucky for us, this is exactly the situation we find ourselves in. We need to build something. We need to learn more by putting something out into production. And we can do that by kind of quantifying and thinking carefully about risk. Uh, in that book, she relates a, a funny exchange with von Neumann, kind of one of the sort of giants in computing. And von Neumann was talking with a colleague and uh, delivered what I have to assume was just like a devastating burn against chess players everywhere. And he said, chess, uh, it's just a well-defined form of computation. And uh, aside from being like very prescient, because of course in, in future decades we saw that literally things like IBM's Deep Blue uh, did very, very well at chess by essentially brute forcing a lot of pieces of it. I think this is relevant for us because it sort of displays a big difference between the known and the unknown. Uh, in chess, the rules of the game don't change out from under you. You don't have any secret things you can't see on the game board. But when we're working in really ambiguous or uncertain decision spaces, all sorts of things might change on a whim out from under us. And we want to not think of it as just rote computation where we're just trying to come to the perfect decision. We want to kind of hedge our bets and think about how much we're willing to lose. And so when I say that we need to make small bets, I have some criteria in mind. 
I like to focus on small because one of the easiest ways for you to go wrong is to immediately spend 10 weeks or two months or a year building out like the perfect version of your design that you just came up with. But what we really want to do now is we want to think about how much investment is the right investment. And we want to get feedback really quickly because feedback is one of the most important and valuable parts of this process. So if we can deliver some sort of value in four weeks, that's our goal. And we want it to be a simple and crisp and easily executed project. So there's all the ambiguity of the broader goal that we're trying to do. We're going to not think about that too much for this. And we're going to make some sort of very crisp bet where I can go build a particular testing framework, or I can try a very specific cloud provider and their service. And maybe that's ignoring some uncertainties we have, and that's perfectly fine. And then if we can do them in parallel, so much the better. We can run a testing system and compare another deployment target uh, at the same time and learn about both simultaneously. And our goal here is diversification. If you think about kind of the, the worst way you can do this, it's if you come up with a great plan and then you lock all 10 of your engineers in a conference room and you don't let them out for a year, right? And they toil away in quiet and silence. Everybody gets a little nervous. Your PM starts knocking and saying like, when are you gonna be done? And then they exit at the end of the year and it either went really well or you wasted an immense amount of time. And by talking about these small bets and several of them, I'm sort of admitting that I don't trust myself to go spend a year in silence doing the thing that I think is best. I wanna hedge my bets a little bit. I wanna make them small. I wanna be willing to lose. And that's a way that you can handle risk and you can kind of handle that uncertainty. Let's look through a couple examples. Walking skeletons are a really good way to go end to end through your project. And you sort of build it out just like you would, just with fewer features, simpler. Uh, literally, it's not fleshed out yet. And the goal here is to make sure you understand how all the little pieces link together and that it works the way you pictured in your head when you try and do all these integrations. On the flip side, if what you're really worried about isn't kind of the way pieces hook together, but some intricate detail of a specific system, you can build a prototype. And this is still cheap because you're focusing in one part of the problem. Maybe you're not even uh, sort of stuck with the code at the end. You're willing to get rid of it. And this can kind of expose for you problems that maybe didn't come up when you were designing it. But as soon as you build it, as soon as you see it in practice, you're like, oh, OK. I see what went wrong here. Uh, and then you can fix it. And in general, whenever you're doing these small bets, you're probably underbuilding something. You're probably putting something out there into your master branch, maybe even into production, that's a little bit not perfect. That's the whole point of it being cheap. So to be uh, safe, to make that possible, you need to use something like a feature toggle, a feature flag, some way of gating code in production so you can put it out there, you can work very quickly, but you can protect your end users. Um, you can check out this DZone article. You can look at LaunchDarkly, a SaaS company in this space. There's a lot of options for it. And so that's sort of our focus on small bets. We want to take all the ambiguity of the problem space, all the uncertainties we have, and sort of try a couple things out and then see how it goes in practice. And that's going to give us a really clear execution path, even though the broader problem itself might still be very murky. It's going to force us to quantify how risky something is. And we can feel good about losing a little bit of investment, but we want to feel good about how many people, how long we're putting into it. And we want to avoid surprise complexity by not letting this drag on three months, six months into a major effort where our only option is to win or go completely broke. And so that brings us to the last, but almost the whole point, the most important section of our process, and that is completing that loop and getting feedback on how good our original plan was and whether we need to change anything. I really love this metaphor. Uh, Deng Xiaoping did some very major economic reforms to China in 1970s, 1980s, and had this metaphor for talking about sort of how, how he approached it. And he described it as crossing a river where you can't see under the surface. And you don't really know what's under there, but you can cross it safely by not blindly charging ahead, but by taking a step and feeling what's underfoot and seeing how you need to adjust your approach depending on that. And this is a very pragmatic approach. This is like the full opposite of what I used to do when I was uh, a more junior engineer, where I would look at the stream, plan my approach, and then do it. You know, whatever I discover, well, that's part of the fun. 
Um, but this is going to be much more resilient to surprises. It matches that experience of trying things out and seeing how it goes. And in general, that's the big difference here. We're now playing an iterated game. We're not taking one big shot at this project and it works or it doesn't. But we're instead focusing on acquiring this feedback quickly. We want to react to it and factor it into our larger plan and make sure that we're updating that central idea of what we're doing and why. And that's kind of the heart of this, is taking what used to be a one-off process and turning it into something that's much, much more resilient to partial failures or surprises or entirely new technologies that didn't even exist when I started this project. We want to be able to go around this circle more frequently, learn more precisely, and the hope is, eventually, the changes to the plan as we loop around become finer and finer. We're zeroing in on something that actually works. We can say that not because we thought so, we guessed, but because we've actually tried it in practice, we've shown it to customers, they're excited about it, we believe that it's possible, and we can build a lot of confidence that way. To wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about moonshots. We talk about moonshots kind of casually. This is, a, if you haven't heard of it, sort of a catchphrase, where you say, we're going to do something big, we're going to do something hard, uh, and you decide that the most appropriate thing to compare your web app to is, you know, mankind going to the moon for the first time. <laughs> uh, and so it's sort of gotten to be a little cliche. You don't think about it too hard. But we talk about this in the sense that we're going to aim really big, we're going to do something really hard, and it's easy to get into a spot, and, and I've done this myself, and I've mentored people who have done this, where you think, well, I can't be the person to lead that kind of effort because it's so big, it's so hard. I've never gone to the moon before. What experience do I have that qualifies me into this job? But if you actually look at how the landing on the moon went and how that process went in the 1960s, it's really ahistorical to talk about whether or not you can stand at the front of a big, hard challenge like going to the moon and know in advance how it's going to go and how to accomplish it. Uh, the, the U.S. space program had a series of iterated shots where they learned how to do harder and harder things. They started by saying, can we even put somebody into space? And then they said, okay, can we put a crew into space and pull a spacewalk off? And then they said, okay, that's easy, but can we get to the moon? That's a bit further. And then finally they said, okay, we got to land on this thing and pick it back up and get back to Earth. And these were each very hard, very challenging problems that were handled sequentially and they built on earlier successes. And I figure if it's good enough for landing humans on the actual moon, maybe there's something here. Maybe I should be learning from this and I shouldn't sort of disqualify myself just because right back at the start, I didn't know how the whole process was going to succeed. And it turns out that this idea actually has kind of a, a cute name, uh, Roof Shots. And if you go to this bit.ly link, uh, I did not come up with this. If you go to this bit.ly link or you go and search for Roof Shot Manifesto, you can see a write-up of this idea. And, and the gist of it is, look, you still want to be thinking about the fact that you're going to go to the moon. That's still the goal at the end of the day. But we're not going to think about how we're going to get there right away. We're going to focus on an intermediate goal between here and the moon, like, say, the roof of my house. And if we can succeed at getting to the roof of my house, that's a concrete goal. It's understandable. I can do that kind of quickly. And that teaches me things that set me up for even more success as I try and get higher and higher and higher and eventually make it to the moon. So check that out. And I think it's kind of honestly a little astonishing how many really hard problems that look absolutely impossible crumble under this kind of repeated sustained attention. Sometimes what you really need to do is just dig deeply into a problem until you've spent so much time with it that the next step, the iterative step that points you in the right direction feels obvious and chase after that thing that feels obvious while always keeping an eye on that future goal. And I hope that that's what we've talked through here today. So instead of trying to think through everything up front, we want to build a process that's more focused on iterated loops, that's focused on catching ourselves when we make mistakes, that's focused on giving ourselves many passes of learning and readjusting as we get closer to our eventual goal. We don't want to give up on planning entirely. I'm, I'm not saying that but we want to make sure we're balancing thinking rigorously and making our best plan for right now with a bias towards action. If we're not testing our theories out, if we're not seeing it in production and seeing it how it goes, we're risking that we are really, really wrong or that something is going to change out from under us. And we want to build into this process guardrails. We want to be really careful of, 
uh, things going poorly, we know we're operating in a, an area with a lot of unknowns, and we need to protect ourselves so that we can notice danger and either stop an experiment or just adjust how it's working slightly. And kind of the goal overall is that this iterative process over and over will give ourselves the chance to realign, to readjust, and to hit that target that we had at the end of the day. And if you only come away with one idea from this talk, I hope it's this one. It's that just because you don't know how to approach a particularly hard or thorny problem right now before you've started it, doesn't mean you aren't capable of nailing it. And many, many people, myself absolutely included, are thoroughly learning as we go. We're figuring things out on our feet in the moment. I'm making up how to present to all of you successfully as I do this. And that's not because I magically knew how to do it before I started, but it's because really the process of doing it, the process of starting and working in this iterative fashion that we talked about today teaches you the skills that you need to succeed. So I hope that a lot of what we've talked about has given you a few tools and will help you approach these kinds of problems safely and wisely and ultimately successfully. Thank you very much.